Hello, everyone. So you might be seeing a new face here. So you can you can think of it as if I have taken over the Ravid show. And today I'm hosting Sharad, uh, who's the CEO and uh, co-founder of Overledge, which is a leading data governance platform that specializes in making your enterprise organize, uh, organization data accessible, trustworthy, and high quality. So I'm super excited because uh, it is this chat is about a topic which I am super passionate about, and there is so much more that I would like to learn from Sharad. He has over 20 years of experience in software and technology industry. He's an expert in data governance, data management, and data uh, data analytics, etc. He also holds a postgraduate degree in nuclear engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. So I'm very glad to welcome you on the show, uh, Sharad. I'm really glad that you are able to join us. And uh, thank you so much for taking out your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ashura. Yeah, it's, it's, it should be a fun chat. You know, uh, I enjoy coming to the uh, rubbish show or wherever it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a fun discussion and uh, Hopefully, the community will get something out of it. Absolutely. So I'm joining from California. Sharad, I believe you're in Atlanta. Yeah, I don't I'm... know where are the other rest of the audience is joining us from. It'll be nice yes, to see. Definitely you. to see, you know, if you can see some, uh, you know, where the people are coming from. So it is yeah, generally absolutely. people are from all over the globe. Yeah, I, I always find it very fascinating asking people where they're joining in from. And it's, it's pretty diverse. Okay, awesome. So let's get started. Um, and before that, I think some of you have already seen the message that um, there's a raffle going on. So if you put hashtag Ravit show in the comments uh, on LinkedIn, you will get to enter the raffle and uh, one lucky winner will get some gifts. So awesome. Okay, so Sharad, let's start um, with the with the discussion that we had. I'm actually curious a little bit about your background. Uh, you had you mentioned that you've done nuclear engineering. So I'm a little curious about like, you know, how you moved from nuclear engineering to data analytics space. Actually, that, that's a very good question. I was in, uh, you know, I was in nuclear engineering then I, uh, it was in 2000 when I did my nuclear engineering, uh, just after Pokhran test in India. So uh, I wanted to uh, kind of work uh, a little bit more in explore a little bit more. So I came out of that and joined computer science kind of industry. Um, then uh, when I was joining computer science industry, I kind of, uh, you know, doing the maintenance management software implementations. And then I found opportunity to work on nuclear power plant, uh, basically the uh, maintenance management software implementation. I said, oh, that is interesting because at least I am have some sort of a nuclear. So I worked for about seven years in different different part of uh, nuclear power plants in US. Um, yeah. Different, uh, almost you take a power plant in US, I have based it there, right? So, yeah. uh, and then when I was working there, kind of really realized that what is the next thing? Because maintenance management is getting mature. Yeah. At that time, every company have implemented that software, kind of like becoming a routine. Uh, implementation. I said, what is the next thing? How the maintenance can be matured and use new advanced technology and data was at that time was coming up quite a bit about 10 years ago. IoT devices, everybody saying that, you know, the, now the IoT will be able to do the better maintenance management. And uh, this is like more about processes. And then I realized it's a good time to go to the data industry. And then I went into the data industry and joined a company named uh, Hortonworks. It's a big data company. It's built basically Yahoo, uh, Yahoo spin-off company. So I joined that company to mostly to learn a little bit as well as to grow and understand that. Once I came out of that Yahoo kind of a spin-off, which is a Hortonworks, it's a, it's a data company. And then I realized that, oh, everybody's working, moving all the data into, into one data platform. So there is a lot more into establish the processes and every area there. So that's why I left Hortonworks and started founding Overledge. And then we started building platform. And uh, at that time, we were thinking that it's a, you need a process to manage it. Yeah. And uh, ultimately came down that there is an industry exist, uh, not industry exists, but there is a whole processes and methodology do exist in this area, which is called data governance. Just right. like nuclear, nuclear utilities have a company for uh, you know, process management. So this is also the call data governance there. So this is where I started and, and kind of work start more around the data governance space. 
so i believe i would like to understand from you and like maybe for the audience let's mm-hmm. break it down and let's get to like level 100 and try to see uh if you can help us understand what is data governance and uh what have you seen over the past few years on why data governance has proven to be one of the critical concepts for organizations so i think that we all know that data, without data is now everything would be very difficult whether it's a chat gpt which is a new outcome you know everything talk about it or any you know important new innovation will happen on top of data right mm-hmm. so if data is not high quality data is not trustworthy data is not accessible to users uh, nothing can be developed right so that is the major problem if you if you th- th- this is what the expectations are expectations are that data should be of good quality then i can build something from that and and to get to that with that point is all around data governance so data governance basically makes you data wherever it is and uh, how do you make sure the data is trustworthy that you can really trust upon it how can you um, kind of like uh, access it how can you kind of do anything around the data is those are the processes is basically uh, around data governance or on the business processes how do you handle those processes so that is what the main outcome is uh, so if you think around it like i is trying to explain data governance from the newcomers like there is a syria and there is a us right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um you know if you go to syria yes there is a there is a, some sort of a security systems are there there is a, some sort of a governance is there but this is a totally governance failure yeah. right but if you if you come to us there is a whole together you know pretty structured everything is there so what us as a country we have achieved is uh, is kind of like okay there is the well defined laws and processes yeah. and policies and implementation of those defined well defined policies and procedures yeah. whatever as a as a as a community as a country what we have established so this is called good governance right and the failure governance can be that hey i have the processes but nobody look around it do yep. whatever everybody is doing is based on their own uh, self interest this is where the the governance fail and when the governance fail the nobody prosper so data is also is uh, is is something like that because the because data when the data is getting originated is it's not originated from an at at a you know at at somewhere it is originating mm-hmm. in various applications right and these applications are managed by various people right uh, and they originate the data based on their processes their business yeah. outcome so yeah. every there are hundreds of applications in organization they are they're creating the data based on their objective their processes and and how come we take all the data and get create something from it right so because a lot of people are involved a lot of processes are needed in order to make some value out of it that's why yeah. the, the well defined processes are needed well defined implementation of those processes are needed and how do you break down that that is the real outcome of the data governance methodologies which basically how do you know this is a complex idea that how do you break down that that's what we call it the, the processes mm-hmm. and the methodologies and that basically create the data governance totally yeah totally that that completely makes sense so sharad as as you were mentioning right like data governance is not a new concept it's been present since like 1980s and at that point in time it was mostly catering to healthcare insurance or financial organizations which were supposed to be capturing such pii information but in the last last couple of decades i would say that the shift has gone from these uh, sensitive data or like pii that's being collected by healthcare insurance financial organizations to companies and like e-commerce websites social media and a bunch of other uh, electronic media that is collecting data that is analyzing your data that is using that data to create ads and what not so when you are dealing with vast amounts of data and the applications of ai how relevant has it how how like how has the relevance of data governance changed and like what are the changes in the principles of data governance that has happened when you are accounting for ai along with it yeah so i think that any level of so just like um, say for example we write research papers right lot of mm-hmm. academies so uh, when we write the research paper we have to always write sources you know where we get this information from so you always have to have sources and then you have to legitimately prove that what the analysis you have done for whatever the research paper it is right so sources and uh, 
and its legitimacy of what the analysis have done and then what the terms really means so so you have gone okay you know uh, you are writing a research paper about a, a, a some chemistry chemical term you have to really define what the chemical term is so generally there are foundational three principles are there what is is the source of the data is authentic genuine right uh, that is a, what we call, generally call it lineage right so that is the one part which which is which need to be there the second part the analysis uh, the because human is doing analysis or machines are doing analysis is the analysis interpreted correctly or not right and then third part is the business terms which is mentioned there is accurately mentioned so this industry is there because based on these foundation three fundamental principles mm -hmm. a lot of companies in like financial uh, there is a laws laws in place in the books uh, right now which is like banking industry after 2008 financial crisis um, you know the the lot of laws has been written uh, so that bank doesn't do any you know mischievous thing and then ultimately they can't play with the books right so they have written the laws so that whatever the reporting is happening through the uh, of banks it's mm -hmm. accurate so that when the bank is showcasing their the numbers it's accurate so they have defined these processes for any and like so so if you think around it uh, the report is a kind of an analytical outcome of mm -hmm. of a lot of data which is gathering right so ultimately you say hey the balance sheet is kind of an outcome so for example any balance sheet come out of a company it need to be accurate it need to be authentic you say there is a billion dollar revenue it cannot be 0.9 billion or it cannot be 1.1 billion yeah. it cannot they, it can there is no scope for uh, you know miscalculation so so if you have a miscalculation the ceo or somebody is going to go to the jail because of that mm -hmm. uh, because they have incorrectly reported the results so right. those uh, foundational principles are there with the within the laws mm -hmm. and those principles have been adopted in many companies organization in the financial sector pii sector and mostly in the area where the where the laws was there but people are saying hey this is the same problem i am having even to to address my my uh, inventory report although there is no law is saying that but i want to make sure my inventory calculation my forecasting model all are authentic and genuine right. so when people want to do that say hey, why not apply the same principles which we are applying you know the banking records which we are applying for financial statements let's apply the same foundational principles of data governance into these areas as well wherever the more trust is needed so ai is a, another area where the mm -hmm. you know the tremendous amount of trust is needed where the data come from where it goes so they let's apply the same principle here as well and use the data governance to to create the better outcome so so, so every industry is realizing that and they are working yeah. they are investing in the data governance space totally totally and uh, like as somebody who's an advocate for responsible ai i see like as data governance as one of the critical pillars of responsible ai because that's something that helps us ensure the ethical use of the data set the ethical uh, use of the use case itself right so what are your thoughts about that that exactly comes down to let's say the chat gpt right which is a, a a new ai solution which come out in the market but is it is it 100% ethical answer is absolutely no the reason for that is um, you know before that uh, any ai solution like for example google have created a lot of ai when you are writing it gives you suggestions so mostly is this uh, ai solution is being built to assist human if you are assisting human there is no problem in that area like like even grammarly and all are these are these are ai softwares and ai tools basically right. this is assisting human uh, human is always a deciding factor but when chat gpt started writing the outcome and if you ask that hey uh, is coke better or pepsi it will come up with some results right, right. so yeah. so when you are when a, a, a they are making the decision for you and and you know coke and pepsi is easier but but mm -hmm. but if you are making a decision of thousands of element and you're coming up with the top 10 or top 5 based on mm -hmm. the, their own analysis yeah they need to present that what is the how did they come up with this analysis and where the data come for the analysis right. if right. you cannot present that 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 means that the analysis which has been presented is not authentic is not genuine mm -hmm. uh, and that that basically fail the test of fails the first test of data governance when yeah. when the when so whatever the policies you write you have to you have to go where the where the data come from how did you make the decision 
Yeah. They have to really lay out the foundation. If you cannot lay out that foundation, that fails the test. And that is where the, the, the responsible AI is very important that how are we leveraging it? Is it yeah. making a decision or is it making only assisting human? So yeah. autopilot, for example, is a phenomenal AI tool, but can mm -hmm. it do at autonomous driving? Yeah. At that time, a lot of checks and balances will going to come. Yeah. Because at that time the human there is no human is in, in in charge and and ultimately the machine is in charge and yeah. and when machine is in charge then who's when it make the mistake then who is responsible for it is it the company or is it the human who is driving so there are a lot of things which need to be figured yeah. out in this area yeah totally and uh, like to your point right like there have been a lot of discussions about why it's an issue because when you are looking at an autopilot driving a car the object of use is the car the technology is provided by the company and the user is the human himself but but there's like so many components that plays as external factors like who is responsible if there is an accident who's responsible for the decisions that the car is making at 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 uh, uh like um at say an unforeseen situation how does the insurance get handled right so there are so many external factors that sort of navigates in this situation that it's very difficult to put a technology like that upfront for people to use. Definitely. And, and yeah. this is something we have to, uh, as a community, as a country, um, you know, we have to lay out the foundational framework. Framework, uh, exactly. It. Yeah, um, and what is those foundational frameworks are like, like as a, as a country and you know, the laws need to be written. Uh, but I think the even the senators and also waiting that how this industry evolved because they don't know. So yeah. nobody knows right now that how this industry is going to evolve. That's why everybody's kind of wait and watch situation. Yeah, uh, right I, I totally agree. And as you were mentioning, Sharad, right, like one of the major challenges for uh, for people to even incorporate a data governance framework is not having the literacy for it right like not understanding how the framework would work how what are the personas who are going to be involved etc those are like some of the basic challenges that we see so what are the other challenges that you have seen over the past few years uh when you are trying to like you know talk to companies and have them uh implement data governance in their framework what are the challenges that you have seen so major challenges is uh, is literally about the data, lit data literacy. People do not understand that, you know, what really is this data is going to do for them. Right. And as they are not able to understand the data, the mostly from the business side is they understand the data can be very powerful, but they do not know how to really get to use for them the data. Right. So that is the the literacy of this is unknown. A lot of unknowns are there, and because of that, uh, people are kind of like uh, hesitant about moving towards any any ai based solution etc cetera, etc cetera, right so yeah. this is this is the literacy is, is a is a is number one problem and the second problem is the quality of the data yeah. um, everywhere you see the data uh, data sits uh, most of the time applications have have gathered you know the tremendous tons of data across the system whether it's the social media systems or or mostly the you know the enterprises have a lot of uh, lot of applications yeah. uh, these datas are are being developed because the tool has not been implemented the way they want to like for example i came from nuclear utilities yeah you know so we have changed it even every year the process is used to change but the software is only the same but the same field is being used by one process and the same field has been used by another process right yeah. So, so this is where I think the there's a lot of challenges are there. Is is this a failure code or this is a failure system? So these are the very um, I would say that fundamentally problems with the data right now yeah. is that understanding of each and every attribute level. So it's it's yeah. understanding at the high level as well as at the attribute level. You know the smallest to smaller dimension of the data. That is it the right and accurate information that is where the with the most challenges are that how do we understand each and every attribute of data is it really telling me this this particular kpi or metrics or individual attribute uh, so that is where the the most of the challenges are i would say that like understanding the foundational element of the data how do you understand that and how do we make sure that everybody in the organization understand that yeah, yeah these are the 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 attributes of the data element yeah. which need to be communicated collaborated and then build something on top of that yeah yeah yeah
totally and um so sharad like when you are when like when you are interacting with all of these organizations what are some of the key considerations that you suggest for the organizations to keep in mind when they are trying to design and implement these data governance frameworks on their on their side yeah so most of the time uh, you know i i ran a survey that how many people are is who is in charge of data governance right so is it is it the business people in charge or the the compliance people in charge or the technology people in charge yeah. so my survey said that around 50% people time the business is in charge about 25% times mm -hmm. uh, the compliance is in charge 25% times which is the it is in charge right so the first yeah. thing is that uh, you know, if you divide the business, in, generally there are three kind of users in the data field, which mm -hmm. is like one is which is working with the data, like the IT people, uh, the data scientist, data engineer. Yeah. Those are the people who 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 know how to write language, who know how to manipulate the data, but they really don't know what it really means. So they need to collaborate with business people to understand that how are they using it and what they get can get out of it. It's it's, okay. a, it's a lot of data analysis and data. AI is, is a collaborative effort between the data scientist and the business because business need to provide the details of every say yeah. for example marketing department they need to know that you know that what, what this lead amount is what this lead number ratio is there are so many ratios so many information yeah. is available the only the marketing the VPs or, or marketing directors are the one who knows the what is going on there yes. but the the analysis work need to be done by data scientists or data yeah. engineers right yeah. so so the first challenge is uh, and and basically what we need to adopt is create a framework where all parties are involved right so this is a, a framework we have designed it um, that all parties are involved and create a committees of that those parties mm -hmm. so mostly by domain domain in the sense that there have to be a, a specific set of data you can say this is a marketing data mm -hmm. and in the marketing data you set up a marketing domain and in that data let's bring some business people let's bring some it people let's bring some compliance people mm -hmm. bring them together and create a committee of them and then they, they become a decision body for that data right so whenever there is a any confusion comes they write the policies around that data that how it should need to be you know accessed who can access it you know, so they need to write the policy about access management of it is they need yeah. to write the policy about its literacy of it, like who's going to understand how it is going to understand and the quality of the data. So they need to write the policy and the implementation of the policy. Yeah. So it's, it, it, I know it's going a little bit detailed, but this is how you need to implement it. It's, it's, it's a very yeah. um, it's a very um, it's a com it's a process which you have to follow right. to yeah. implement data governance at, at the lowest level. Yeah, so you have sort of like broken it down to personas who will be sort of the stakeholders for managing the framework in the organization. And then we need to have some like techniques or processes in place that sort of uh, holds as the backbone of how do you want to manage the data governance framework. And obviously you need some kind of like toolkit that helps you uh, build that end to end, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And when you're like in, in your opinion, and, and I see there are a few questions about the same as well on the chat, where do you see in the next few years, like, you know, uh, you, you are seeing a bunch of generative AI tool, toolkits coming out there right now. You have seen how, uh, how we have moved into adopting AI technology more more and more over the years where where it has become like part of our lives each and every piece of gadget that we hold in our hands these days is using some uh, some form of machine learning or like artificial intelligence in it so in the next few years like what is your vision on how data governance would change or be adopted and what are the differences that, that you think needs to be done even in the data governance space as in when we are evolving with these technology so, you know, as a data governance, uh, as we are, because a data governance platform, we use internally AI quite a bit because uh, to so A, to identify all the PII information, right? That is where uh, we, we use quite a bit. Then we started using the, you know, generative AI to write descriptions of the data, etc. So those are the, the AI we are using internally to facilitate the data governance frameworks, right? So that yeah. is the, the one part of it is. But as a as uh, companies who are using data to write their own AI systems, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if the AI systems, there are two, I, I can still very easily differentiate between two areas. 
one is human assistance mm -hmm. like you know chat gpt if they are using for human assistance then there are not many issues of uh, data governance in general mm -hmm. uh, because the, because ultimately these are the tools which is helping human to do their work better mm -hmm. and ultimately human is in charge but when and when the ai is going to make decisions on behalf of human mm -hmm. this is where the issues of governance comes quite a bit at the larger level yeah. because when the decision is made by a machine at that time there is a lot of uh, issues are coming into the place because because our whole framework as our whole community and whole country ecosystem has been designed and worked upon that how human and how human is in charge human goes to jail human he, human is it's all about human you can't send machine right. to jail right, right. so right. so you still ultimately it's, it's it's going to be the human responsible ability yeah. will be there yeah. and, and and this is where the the most of the challenges is going to come, come up yeah. that how the uh, uh, the new system the new ai models the new uh, things which is going to come up if they are assisting human they will be super successful okay. if they are not assisting human and they will be out of a lot of things will be in in lawsuits uh I, I don't think the court will move that fast to decide it will take another five, 10 years for them to kind of come up with frameworks yeah. for laws and policy. And that's yeah. where I think I next five years, you will see a lot of dilemma like that, that yes. some yeah. tools will come, which will make a decision. And then the lawsuits will come immediately after that to kind of counter it. And but that that's what I see the little chaos for next five to 10 years. And then maybe five to seven years, we will see some chaos and then some framework of uh, laws will come in place because of obviously the demand will create and then some sort of a uh, this you know this will clutter out and then come, come some sort of framework will come out of that that's my thinking process may take five years may take 10 years but it will it will not take more than 10 years otherwise uh, because this industry is evolving so fast that within within yeah. 10 years people have to figure out that how to yeah. how to take care of this ai yeah systems. totally Totally. That's that's very well articulated. Like, thank you so much for, you know, like putting it out on what would be the challenges that we will see on the way. And uh, I think like before getting on to the questions, I wanted to also understand like Overledge has been in the data governance space for like close to a decade. So what are the what are the contributions and like, development that Overledge has done for like data governance solutions? And what are the like companies key priorities that you have seen in the area? Yeah, so we are very customer focused, basically. So we work for customers who are implementing data governance, right? So we ask, we build the products and tools what customers are asking. Right. Uh, so, so this is our kind of guru mantra has been always that how do we build our product and methodology? So what we are hearing from the customer is, is what they want is, is, is quickness in the implementation of the data governance policies. Right. Uh, they want what they want is that, hey, um, I know it's, it's difficult because I, I try to explain you. It's, it's very right. difficult to implement and roll out data governance. What they want is that, hey, can you simplify us for us? Mm -hmm. Can you simplify this data governance policies for us? So what they what the customers are asking is, hey, is there out of box for policies which right. work for everyone? Like yeah. so, this is the demand from customer. Of course, there are it's very difficult to create out of box so that everybody can follow it. But it's not that easy. But yeah. this is the demand of the customers are most of the time. Sure. And uh, this is uh, this is what we are working towards. What we are working towards. What we are customers asking? Can we create, uh, you know, at least by industry segment? by by banking by healthcare yeah. by you know government utility sector can we simplify the data governance for a specific area and then give them the products and solution they are looking for so that's where like our drive is coming from that that how should we simplify for, for customers right. yeah makes sense and uh Sharad, i think i'm gonna get into some of the questions here and this sort of like falls through with what we were discussing earlier right like data literacy so before like having companies adopt data governance we have to help them understand what data really means like what are the capabilities what are the uh, uses of the data what is the return on investment that they will get when they are investing in this data set so what are what are your thoughts on the best practices to help companies go through a data literacy program before getting into data governance i think so as i um, so 
data literacy is number one thing before you implement data governance i agree and it's, it's a part of the governance so if you think about it syria versus us uh, syria what the problem is missing is education right, right. Um, if i don't think that they have a very good education system in the country and if you get any prosper country whether it's in norway or or finland any country you go which is as prosper as it is what you will find is the education is number one instrument mm -hmm. right not the security not that much they, of course security is needed but but this the literacy is the literacy is kind of education again think of data governance as a, as you are building a new country ecosystem you are building a new ecosystem which will come out of data and data mm -hmm. is is a, is a foundational pillar so data literacy is the foundation for the data governance uh, for for the overall governance right because if the literacy is not there then if the education is not there then they can't do anything and yeah. any data products cannot be developed by one data scientist yeah absolutely right? it it cannot be developed by one data engineer it is a collaborative effort between a lot of people who is using the data they are they are giving them the inputs about it so that's why the data literacy is 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 the most foundation for the data governance program and then uh, data literacy generally we generally consider a three foundation data literacy data access and data quality mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for the data governance and literacy yeah. is number one and there is a way to 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 promote the data literacy is uh, is uh, a is creating the data catalog we, we generally create data catalogs to give access to everyone to the data so they can learn yeah. about the data they yeah. can search about the data so that is a, like one of the tool which we have established yeah. but but also like creating a lot of sessions about it telling about what the data you owns what yeah. data you have what data you don't have how do you access it how do you create products out of it so there's a lot of data literacy exercises need to be in place sure yeah yeah makes sense and uh so we have another question and uh it's more of yeah, it's more of uh, understanding from like the ethicality of the data. So this, I don't know what the person's name is. It doesn't show up. Uh, but they're asking if from like the ethicality of data perspective, does that need more acknowledgement? I, I don't know whether I got the question right. But in my understanding is, uh, is, is the data need to be like, if I, if you are using my data as a, as a PII information, can do I need to acknowledge that you are using my data? Is, is this, I think this is what they mean by it, right? So if, if for example, if I give my data to Facebook or Google, mm -hmm. do they have, uh, do, do they have, do they have to acknowledge that my data is used mm -hmm. or do they have the right to use my data, right? So that may be the, the I'm understanding again, uh, there are laws in place right now, which is generally considered as a GDPR, which is a one of the, the main foundational law which was written in, in Europe and a lot of companies a lot of countries have started adopting this law that what can you use the PII data which is the personally identified data of the customers or mm -hmm. what cannot you use for and you have to literally explain them and they ask you to delete it you have to delete it so these are the laws are there in Europe as well as in California uh, other US states have not adopted this law neither federal have created a law yet but soon you would expect something very similar to a GDPR range, which kind of talks about the data and it's uh, it's kind of like it's use of the data, or the PII data, like personally, my data basically stand from, which is the end user's data point of view. Okay. Makes sense, yeah. So, um, so Scott says that it's a great overview that you've provided him. Awesome. So let's get on to the next question. So what do we have here? So this is another LinkedIn user. I'm not sure what your name is. I'm really sorry for some reason it doesn't show up. But they're asking, how is this data governance different from SOX compliance? Generally, finance people know SOX. I heard Archer is one of the one of the governance tools. Yeah. So data. Uh, so SOX compliance is uh, is I would say that the comp the data governance objective is to comply with all the laws of the data. So mm -hmm. SOX is one of the law, right? There are the BCBS 239 is, is another law. There is a, uh, you know, the GDPR is another law. So there are multiple laws which need to be, which need to be, which need to be kind of enforced mm -hmm. as SOX is one of the law. So, so 
if you see around it, uh, most of the time the financial balance sheet which comes out of uh, which comes out of the companies, mm -hmm. uh, any statement which is the public companies, if you report anything about the financial statement, that needs to be authentic, genuine. It needs to go to all three principles of the data governance, which is like where the data come from. Mm -hmm. Is the is obviously the all the statements of this one come from the ledger? Is this the all the calculation has been accurate or not? And all the, the terms which you define, the revenues, et cetera, are properly defined, yeah. right? So those are the three foundational principles of the data governance, which SOX compliance also tells you that about, but SOX compliance only talks about the balance sheet, right? It doesn't talk right. about the PII data, but yeah. the GDPR talks about the PII data. So there are, so data governance talks about all the data. That's the difference. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. Totally. Okay. Uh, so let's move on to what we have next. Okay, um, Bubal Ganeshan has a question and they're saying that I have been working with Colibra for our data governance effort. Is there any other tool that's better right now in the market that they should check out? Overledge. Uh, so we are uh, directly compete with Colibra and yeah. pretty good, um, you know, so uh, if you are not happy with them, definitely come to Overledge. Totally. And thank you for awesome. asking this question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, so let's see what do we have more. Okay, so let's see what Aaron has to say. Aaron says, "Do you think that anything like that would uh, what we call normal as being the same when the smoke clears?" I'm not really sure what your question is, Aaron. I am not able to get as well. Yeah, let's. Probably... I think what he's asking is is that. Um... Anything like that, what call normal when the smoke clears so is, is like uh, when all this, uh, the laws and regulation will come, what will happen? Something like that. And Aaron, if you don't mind, can you rephrase your question so we can get to it? Thank you. In the meantime, we'll move on to the next one. So Adrian asks, what do you think we can do today, even if we don't use AI yet, that much to prepare for the new adoption era? I think that's a very good question. I, I think that everybody should think about it is that first, uh, before you start adopting AI, first you need to adopt data governance principles. You start uh, uh, adopting the, start creating the data catalog, you start putting all the information there so that when the AI revolution start and then you start using it, you don't have to do the, again, the, you, you're not be left behind in the sense that you are, all the data is ready. So I generally, sometimes I consider as a, as a kitchen, Right. If you are a, if you are a, if you are working in your own kitchen, you know it's very easy. But if you want other people to come to use your kitchen, you have to think about it differently. That because uh, now where the everything is, you have to nicely put the labels to it, whether it's, it's a sugar or whether it's a salt. Otherwise, you know people can put different things. Uh, you uh, you individually know whether it's a salt or sugar, but the other person who is going to work will be very difficult for them. So that labeling is needed. So this is what we call it cataloging. So for, because right now the data is used by application people, they know what they're doing. And when you're giving to other people to use this, that's why the labeling and, and putting the right tag about the data is very important. So that is the one thing you must start before you use it. And that's one of the things with building the data catalog and putting uh, yeah. this is, is needed before you start AI. Totally. Okay, so we'll probably go over maybe a couple of more questions. Mm -hmm. So Bhagya Subrayan asks, how do you think users and developers of AI technologies can concisely play a role in, uh, consciously play a role in data governance? So I think they, they play a very important role in the data governance uh, because when they write the model, they need to, they first write that what the model does and, and how does it, it does so that is the one part of the data governance but if they are using if they are producer of the data that they, they, they must uh, put the the information into that so generally in the data governance we generally consider three roles the one is the data owners owners are the one who is provide the like who owns the data from the business perspective mm -hmm. um, second is the data stewards which is generally maintain the data uh, you know the about the information and the third is the data custodian who basically maintain the it part of the data you know where the data come from they like most of them they're technical users mm -hmm. so the developers of the ai technology which is consuming the data right most of the time because they are consuming the data and building their model further so because they are building something so they need to document they need to put together what they are building and every part of this so they are the key component of the they can be the data steward for that 
or they can be the data consumer for the, the raw data. So they are they are the key player of the data governance journey overall. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. So Aaron is mentioning something, but I'm trying to understand. So Aaron is saying once AI is a normal uh, is normal as force in our daily lives, laws are more or less settled, and an expectation is more or less in place for how it will or won't be used. Are you asking? I believe he's trying to ask. I think it's a comment. You, it's, I think it's a comment. Uh, change then. Yeah. yeah, I think that when they're saying dust is settled, I think you already answered the question. I think it's more of like comment. Uh, and I think I agree yeah. with the once the AI is, is, is like the, when the laws are settled, that means the government and everybody as a community, we agreed yeah. upon it. This is how okay. we are going to use the AI. Yeah. Yeah. I think even right now, there is a lot of uh, mist around how, uh, like, how do you qualitatively assess the good and bad of these technology? Because some organizations do have their own like AI ethics framework where they are able to assess the uh, like ethical aspects of the technology and they're able to say that this is a go or no go. But that's not become a norm otherwise, where people are like organizations are able to assess this upfront if a particular technology is going to have these ethical issues or not. So I think that's that's what uh, that's what like Adam is trying to say that once we have all of these in place where we have laws in place that are now fueling organizations to make their decisions on how and uh, what to build their AI technology with that's that's the that's what we are like uh, looking for in the future. And yeah. you know this yeah. is the yeah. same thing comes down to the two conversation is like are you assisting human or you are making a decision for a human? And, exactly. and as soon as yeah. if, if you divide into two areas and, and the first area is, is all good because whether it's a recommendation engine of Amazon or whether it's a recommendation engine. So any recommendation for human yeah. is being you know, flourishing uh, in their business model. Um, yeah. They are yeah. making yeah. money, tons of money. But when they started making decisions, then you will see a problem. Yeah, I think the 100% uh, autonomous activity is what the challenge is right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Susan. How can we make data governance more appealing to get more people engaged? That is my objective as well. Uh, how to make people, uh, you know, uh, adopt to data governance more and more. Mm -hmm. And again, the, these are the, the other exercise which we are doing to make data governance more aware about it, more people knowledgeable. But the one thing what is for sure is that without data governance, it is very difficult for organization to use data for any good use. It is yeah. just almost impossible. Yeah. So people need to understand that this is a, a necessary thing which they have to do. The only thing is that do they do it uh, with a, with a willingly, uh, you know, with happily, or they they know oh, it's a checkbox for me. So this is where uh, we like we at Overledge is working as well quite a bit. Is that we want to make sure that you are working for you know as a checkbox to make mm -hmm. sure that you're complying with the law. But you can you improve the efficiency. Can yeah. you improve the productivity of the data engineer? So we are also building tools to, as soon as you know, you are doing the, you are improving the efficiency of the, mm -hmm. the data engineer and uh, data scientist. On the other side, you are also checking boxes. Totally, yeah. yeah. And we have a question from Amit. Uh, he's asking, how is Overledge different from other governance tools? So I think this is a uh, very good question and I'm the right person to answer it. So one is the overlay is overall, overall integrated tool. So you have to buy like three tools in the market to come up with your one objective. It's like, a, like, it's like a other tools are the point solutions. Like for example, uh, one is doing the purchasing, another one is doing the invoicing, third one is doing the ledger, but all is very integrated together, right? So overlay is a well integrated tool. And if you compare our, uh, you know, the, um, our comparison sheet, you will kind of like you see that that why the integration is needed, mm -hmm. and why the the data catalog need to be merged with data governance product as well as with the data access capabilities, data lineage capabilities. Everything is comes in one uh, solution, yeah. and it's a lightweight product. So that's how it is uh, different than others. And uh, generally, when you compare overlay with other product, you just cannot go with other product. Uh, this is the uh, this is one of the the key feature what we generally very proud of. Thanks, Shara. Thanks for that. 
I'm going to put this message because I know Tim. Tim, uh, I worked with Tim before at IBM. Hi, Tim. So Tim says, before any governance and effort in data, understanding and data topology is required. Um, I totally agree. And that's what we have been speaking about, that data literacy, data understanding is something that we need to do much before before we get into the data governance, because that's what will help us understand the nuances that we have in the field. So totally there. Um, OK, so we have an interesting question from Scott. Will things like data fabric, data mesh, and semantic layers replace the need for data governance? What are you? I think they, they uh, Scott, you know that data fabric and data mesh, they are saying that the, you need a fair data governance. So they are talking about data governance in their framework itself. So I don't think they will they will replace the need for it. And again, these are the, the methodologies. These are not a product. So the even the fabric and mesh both are talking about a, a governance framework in to start with. So I don't think that they then they how would they replace this when they are, when the framework itself is talking, there is a need for it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um oh. We have a shout out from someone and this Adrian is saying we've been working with Overledge for the past few months. Definitely an excellent value and support provided by Overledge team. Is there any plan to add more features related to AI in addition to the existing use? Definitely, Adrian. Uh, we are coming up with a lot more features. Uh, you know, that's what I said. We keep listening to the customers quite a bit. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, definitely we are improving quite, a, uh, you know, we are adding data quality is uh, 6.1 which is coming in around end of uh, mid of april or end of april somewhere hopefully mid of april um so that is where we are adding data quality features and then after that we soon will be adding a lot more features and i will keep communicating that to the to the community awesome okay uh i think we have gone through all of the comments here and if you do have anything else to share um Sharad, if you suggest or recommend any reading material that people can go through, or uh, especially because there, there are people with varied level of expertise, uh, I'm sure there are a bunch of folks who are still very new to data governance and still are exploring the data literacy side of things. So maybe some reading material or resources that will be helpful for them uh, versus some people who are already like uh, veterans in their industry and, you know, like some more advanced or uh, reading material that can help them up their game in uh, in their organizations that will be very helpful if you do have any suggestions thank you Ashutaya. so i wrote a blog about like overledge.com slash what is data governance i i hope uh, like i think ramit just shared it yeah uh, so what this blog what we have defined is the benefits of the data governance and how can you use data governance for your defense which is like checklist which is like law complying with the law to the offense, which is like productivity, uh, which is an adoption of the data. And how do you take the, if you're doing one activity, uh, you know, then how can you use for both sides, right? This is the, the real advantage, what we have kind of trying to design. So for example, if you do classify your data, right? Because you have to differentiate between the PII data and non-PII data, as yeah. because the laws ask you to do it. But because you have classified it so that now with the adoption point of view, you can give access to everyone in the organization with the data. Mm -hmm. So this is how the what we are trying to do is that doing for defense as well as for offense is the simultaneously. And that is where uh, I'm trying to write it down that how do you do it and what are the different benefits of the data governance and then what is and then why you do it and then who are the players who are going to do it, uh, basically the data you know, chief data officer to data owners, steward custodians, and then how do you do it? You know, the step by steps uh, yes, in the sense that how do you do it? So we, the whole is it's a pretty long blog. It will take probably 15 minutes to read it mm -hmm. and but it will take probably two years to implement it <laughs> awesome. in the organization. Yeah, fully. Hey, I think we'll go with one last question. Um, so Bubal Ganeshan asks, I learned that some IDs are planning on integrating chat GPT to it. I think he's mentioning uh, to your previous comment on Overledge. So is that going to affect the developers in the long run? Yeah, I think the chat GPT is going to play a very important role in every part of the, uh, you know, generative AI, basically. Uh, so most documentation will be much more easier. People will be able to, you know, uh, overall, the documentation would be easier to consume the literacy will be easier uh, across the organization 
but again the data governance we generally deal with the problem is when you have two conflicting ideas about a specific term if you know you know whatever the document you write if you call this cup a a pen and some people are calling this cup it is very difficult to communicate you we have to agree that we call this cup and then only we can communicate collaborate so the but the organization generally use a lot of link you know the the words and the KPI and the metrics and the, especially at the data level, too many things for the same in, 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 same information has been called multiple things as well as multiple things called same thing, right? So that is the big problem which we have, which ChatGPT cannot solve it, uh, which is only the where collaboratively we yeah. can solve it. Totally, totally. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Sharad. Like uh, you have also given me a lot of food for thought and um, yeah, I will try to also see if you have anything else that you would like to share, maybe something which is more of like a book book resource or like a, a, like a more extensive course kind of a thing. Please do that with me or Ravit and we'll, be, we'll make sure that we'll share it with the audience. But thank you so much for taking out your time. Uh, I'm sure it's like closer to lunchtime for you. So I will uh, leave you a little early. So you have a few minutes to yourself. Wonderful. Thank you, Ashura. It was really great chatting with you. And Thank it's you. a fun, uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. And I do believe like there were a few comments on the um, on the chat that people wanted to see what Overledge looks like. So maybe we can do that in the next session where you can dig deeper into what the platform does and what the capabilities are. Yes. And then if you have any question, you can just visit Overledge.com and ask for demo and we can help you to give you the demonstration of the product. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, just another reminder to put hashtag the Ravit show in the comments below. That will help you get into a raffle and you will get to win some fun goodies. So, OK. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Ravit, for letting me hijack your show. And thanks, Sharad, for joining us and giving us a very, very detailed overview and a very uh, strategic plan about data governance. Thank you. Thank you so much.